Good afternoon. For those who don't know, I'm Ken Gibson, Library Director. Thank you for coming to today's special event, which has its genesis in the observation of the building's cornerstone last summer by former library staff employee Christian Boyles. Is Christian here? I know he had signed up. He may be here a little bit later. Uh, but we want to thank him for sort of getting the idea rolling to have a special uh, celebration today. It's an honor to have our president, Father Michael Graham, Society of Jesus, join us to make introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, and uh, good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody here. Um, it is hard to believe that Tom and I were just talking, Father Keneally, that this building is, in point of fact, 50 years old, you know. Uh, and so uh, it's odd too, it, it usually in the spring, of course, we're gathering to sort of look back in this valedictory way um, on things that have happened during the course of the year and award students and congratulate people and so on. Um, and I suppose that's kind of what we're doing today, looking back over 50 years, but it's really a birthday that as much as anything looks forward, it seems to me, you know. I was thinking um, as I was uh, going about the business of the day, Ken and I met a little bit earlier today, uh, but I was thinking about my own experiences with libraries over the years, you know. Uh, the grand one was the graduate <coughs> library at the University of Michigan with these polished wood tables that went on for about two blocks, you know. <laughs> um, and I had the experience, whenever I saw a book cited or a journal article uh, anywhere, I could always get it there until I started studying religion, which I found very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the library before that uh, was a small uh, library at Cornell College, not the main library, but there's this uh, one building that housed a geology collection and it had a, it was the old library on campus, uh, the original Andrew Carnegie Library on <laughs> campus, and it had been, uh, it, so it, it, it housed the geology collection, who, who, knew why exactly, but it had these wonderful nooks, you know, kind of up on the uh, top floor, and I would go there with buddies of mine, um, and we would stake out sort of like a back corner with a window overlooking part of the campus, Saturday afternoon, you know, and then we'd go to dinner and we'd come back, and we could just spend all of our time there, um, which reminded me really of the library before that, which was the public library back in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, another Ar Andrew Carnegie Library, actually, um, where I remember kind of going into a corner in the kids' library um, and just kind of with a pile of books and just reading them, you know? And I remember at one point, a classmate of mine who was there at the same time took a plastic spider <coughs> and mm. put it in front of me without my even noticing that she had done that, right? <laughs> and suddenly I look up and there's this gigantic spider, <laughs> right? And I just went through the roof. Well, because I'm talking to academics, you, you know what that experience is like. <laughs> Not the spider part necessarily, but being so lost in the book, you know, so completely captivated by it, um, that it's as if the rest of the world vanishes somehow. It's just you and this, you know. Um, it's kind of a life that we're called to. So that experience really kind of played itself out uh, at Cornell College and um, at the University of Michigan and on and on and on uh, over the course of my own career, although libraries and I don't see too much of each other uh, nowadays, <laughs> as you might imagine. So it's a real pleasure to be here today with you to celebrate a building, yeah, you know, but the fundamental activity that the building itself supports, um, which is that being lost um, in the thoughts <coughs> of others that are uh, written down for our own edification and renewal. Um, and so it really is less a looking backward uh, that we have today uh, before us than a real looking forward. 50 years young this place is, um, it has a little brother, up there, <laughs> a younger brother up the hill, uh, but this is uh, where its heart is. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to be able to celebrate this anniversary with you all today. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Father Graham, for your time and for your personal memories and sharing those with us. 
Before introducing our next speaker, because he has to leave by 4 p.m. today, I would like to take a moment to especially acknowledge archive student worker, Matthew Gretz. Matthew, who along with Stephanie Schaefer, played the violin in providing today's music. However, it wasn't just any violin that Matthew was playing, but Father Francis Finn's violin. And as many of you know, Father Finn is the individual responsible for coming up with Xavier's team name and mascot, the Musketeer. I believe, Father Keneally can correct me, 1925. Close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so positive how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> Playing that violin today was something of a bit of coming full circle for Matthew because last year he curated <coughs> an engaging year-long library exhibit that was quite popular and well-received called The Legendary Musketeer. And that was based on a paper he had written for a class, I think the year before, uh, in which uh, he suggested that the original D'Artagnan statue that was on campus <coughs> and had been put in storage be resurrected and once again placed on campus, perhaps even in the new altar hall. As we now know, that's in fact what did occur, and we can thank Dr. Jim Snodgrass for moving that idea forward, and of course Father Graham for approving <coughs> that. And it seemed to be the right moment and occasion to recognize Matthew's pivotal role in making that happen. And so thank you, Matthew. <laughs> now it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Father Thomas Keneally, Society of Jesus. <coughs> Father Keneally has been with Xavier University for 47 years in several major capacities, the last 10 part-time as university archivist. This he considers retirement. <laughs> Father Keneally will be giving a short presentation on the history of the library at Xavier. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of hearing Father Keneally giving a presentation, I can assure you that you are in for a real treat. Mm -hmm. Father Keneally. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I noticed that the word short appeared in the <laughs> remarks. Uh, I'll try to honor that this afternoon. It becomes a bit of a problem. You get into a topic like this and uh, one can get carried away, but I'll try to avoid that. This, in many respects, will be the history of Xavier Library and its five homes. I like to think of it that way. And we might as well get on with it since time is a bit limited and, and maybe we could give us the first picture here. The library, like the university, started here. Uh, this is 18, 1831 in downtown Cincinnati. This would be the west side of Sycamore Street between 6th and 7th, roughly where St. Xavier Church is today. This was the original property, and um, the building on the left, of course, was the cathedral at the time. Uh, bid and uh, consecrated uh, to St. Peter's, and that uh, building went up about 1826. In between it was the bishop's home, because this is where the bishop lived at the time, Bishop Fenwick, and later his successor, Bishop Purcell. And this is the school over here. The building was called the Athenaeum, sometimes the Literary Institute, sometimes the liter Literary Establishment. It was completed in 1831, it was two and a half stories, and it really had just about anything a school would have, classrooms and a library. There was also a chapel there, also a reading room, and also space living room for faculty members. On the top floor, there was a dormitory, believe it or not, and many students came as far away as from Louisiana in the south to come to school here, and they lived up in that attic. It must have been a lovely place, especially when school year went to the latter part of July. <laughs> but this is the school that was founded by Bishop Edward, Edward Fenwick in 1831. In 1840, his successor, 
uh, Bishop Purcell asked the Jesuit fathers to take over the school. He simply didn't have faculty to staff it and thought the Jesuits would do a good job. So in 1840, eight Jesuits came from St. Louis, five priests and three brothers, and we took over the institution and we changed the names of St. Francis Xavier College, or simply St. Xavier College. We know there was a library in the building. It's described in the catalog of 1843. The institution possesses a good library of about 6,000 books. The presumption is they were mostly philosophy and also classical literature, Latin and Greek. But 6,000 was a pretty substantial library. The catalog of 1848 or 49 indicates that a second library was added somewhere there, a student library. And adjoining it was a reading room, and I, I kind of like this. This is from the catalog of 48-49. Uh, Attached to the student library is a reading room where the most respectable journals are received, and where the most discreet students are permitted to spend a portion of each day. I don't know what a discreet student is, but that's where they, they <laughs> did their library work. By 58, 59, the library had grown to um, about 8,000, and by the uh, end of the uh, quarter, about 1865, there was a collection of about 10,000 books, not a bad library. And let's move on. This is an interesting picture. If you've ever wondered, or maybe you have from time to time, what the school looked like downtown. And basically, this was the layout. Notice the new church. This was built in 1860, the previous church having been torn down. Next to it now is the old Athenaeum building. The Athenaeum building was originally described as beautiful, as spacious, as large and substantial and well proportioned. By the time this picture is taken, probably about 1875, they're describing this building as in shambles, as ugly, dark and gloomy. And one of the real problems is the church casts such shadows on the building that you needed artificial light to do anything in the building at all. The third building, and you can see it a little bit, went up in 1854. This is the Carroll Building. It's one of the very few pictures we have of it. They desperately needed space, and Father Carroll, the fourth president, decided to put up this building in here. And they had a very nice museum of which they were uh, very, pr uh, very proud. The final building, and you can see it there, is at the corner of 7th and Sycamore, and that is the Walter Hill Building, which was built immediately after the uh, Civil War. And at that point, the library was removed from this building and moved down to the uh, hall building. We'll take a look at it from another point of view here. This is the uh, campus, so to say, downtown around 1916 or 17, before we moved. But notice a number of changes. The church is still there. It has uh, undergone a terrible, disastrous fire in 1882, but has been restored. Notice the Athenaeum is gone. Notice the Carroll Building is gone. It's now kind of a lawn there. And this is the Hill Building that I talked about earlier. We know now that the library was on the first floor here. And you went up these double stairs into the Walter Hill Building. It was on the right. And that, that, that's the room right there. This, the rest of this plant, of course, comes later. The Walter Hill building is 1868. Behind it, a second building went up in 1885, the Muller building, named after the president, and the one they were really proud of, the building that went from these all the way over to the church, and simply called the classroom building. That was completed in 1891, and that's when the, um, the Athenaeum came down. So that's what the campus looked like, but maybe we can show you a few other pictures here. This is the library about 1880. Now, I think this might be more the student library because also you have the exhibits here. But it is a very substantial library of about three or 4,000 books. And this is what was called the professor's library or the college library. And their collection was up to about 30,000 in about 1880. Uh, very nicely laid out. Um, there's a nice description of it. And uh, this, as I say, was the one on the first floor of the Hill Building. And let's take a look at the next one. 
The catalog of 1894-1895 mentions a librarian for the very first time among the officers of the university. And that first librarian is this gentleman, Father John Poland. Father John Poland and his brother William are important figures in Xavier history for, for a number of reasons. But he was the first librarian and um, uh, we have records of some of the work that he has done. While he was a librarian, his sister, perhaps his sister-in-law, Mary Poland, also donated money for installing lights in the library, electric lights, in 1896. Can you imagine what the library must have been like before electric lighting? And it is to his sister or sister-in-law that the school owed its lighting system. And this is interesting. Uh, it comes from the Cincinnati Enquirer, and you notice the date 1901. Very interesting, preparation now being made for moving the great library to more commodious quarters in the college. The big library, known as professors, comprises 30,000 volumes at this point, contains among this number some of the rarest books in the world. The second largest library of its kind in this state, being surpassed only by Marietta, I presume Marietta College. The library at present is in the extreme northeast part of the building where all the smoke and dirt from the surrounding factory sifts through. It's impossible to keep the plugs clean. The large classroom on the second floor was chosen and will at once be fitted out for occupancy. So they simply moved the library from the first to the second floor. And this really uh, kind of establishes it as the second home of the Les Avery Library. The first in the Athenaeum and here in the Hill Building. And when we move on, this is a picture of the library staff uh, from the year 1912. I presume this is the professors, the college library. It has kind of that look about it. But these uh, young men served as staff, and uh, this was what it looked like shortly before the move out here. And this is interesting. This is a little card that appeared in most of the books. It's student's library, notice. This book may be kept for two weeks and may be renewed once for two weeks. Fine for detention beyond this two cents per day. If lost, it will be replaced and if damaged, it will be repaired at the expense of the borrower. The rules of the library can be found in the reading room and ignorance will excuse no one from their <laughs> observance. I don't, that doesn't apply to faculty, I presume, <laughs> since it's strictly students. And as you know, in 1911, uh, the decision was made to move the school from downtown out here. On September the 19th, 1911, the, the college, Xavier College, bought what was known as the Avondale Athletic Club at the time, cr close to where we are right now. This was the only building on the property, and this was really the clubhouse for the Avondale Athletic Club. And if this stands, this building of course no longer exists, but the uh, Joseph Building is where this building once was. So this would be Dana Avenue here. Winding Way would go off in that direction over there, and Ellet Hall would be over here. Uh, so it's, um, as you come down Reading Road, uh, coming right toward Joseph, that's where this building would have been. As I say, it was the only building here in 11. It was torn down with great reluctance in 1968. They really wanted to keep it, but renovating it would have been so enormously expensive, it just didn't pay, so the building came down. In 1919, a major decision was made by the college. And it was in that year they decided to divide St. Xavier College into two institutions. One, the four lower grades became St. Xavier High School, and they remained downtown in the building that you saw. That became the high school in 1919. The college division moved to this campus here, the 26 acres that had been bought from the Avondale Athletic Club. So this is the beginning. The library we know was in that building, uh, somewhere on the first floor. They say 40,000 volumes. Now, how they got 40,000 volumes into that house, I, along with everything else there, I, I, I'm not sure. But that was the third home of the library, and it remained the home for, from 1919 to 1926. 
Ann? I thought you might like to meet a couple of the librarians. Uh, this is uh, Catherine McGrath, who was librarian for one year in 1925. And uh, Miss Lemdieu was librarian in 1926. I picked her because I love that French name, Lemdieu. It's beautiful. But for the ladies here, I'd like to point out something. Though the College of Liberal Arts moved from downtown out to this campus in 1919, it is true that the law school and we did have a law school, many people don't know this, and the evening school stayed downtown. So there had to be a library. This is the library downtown. But there's also something else significant in here. Women were admitted to the night school in 1919. So voila, we have a young lady in the library at the school. I thought we had to put that picture in here. Yeah. And in 1926, Xavier was in, had been a, a accredited by the North Central, and there probably was a great deal of pressure to build a new library building, and that's what happened. In 1926, uh, this picture has a little bit later, but this is from 1926. This is a picture of what the campus looked like, maybe about 1932. That football played a big part is rather evident, just one look at that picture. And you can incidentally understand why dropping football in 1973 was so controversial. It was a big deal. But this row of buildings, you're looking eastward, this row of buildings were the original buildings put up here. So here is what is now Edgecliffe Hall. It was alumni hall at one time, science. Then next is the Walter Seaton Schmidt Library Building. That went up and it was dedicated in 1926. Then of course there's Hinkle and then there's uh, uh, Albers beyond that. And uh, this will kind of give you some idea of, this, of what the campus looked like. Yeah? This is a close up of, uh, of the various buildings. And of course, on the right here, you can see what is now Edge Cliff. And the next building would be the Walter Seaton Schmidt uh, Library. Just to talk about it, of course, this was the Zebra's Library fourth home. It was built in a Tudor Gothic style. Its initial capacity was 100,000 volumes. It was designed by a noted Cincinnati architectural family of Steinkamp, Joseph and Bernard Steinkamp. It cost $250,000, and the money was raised by the Xavier Foundation, headed by Walter Seaton Schmidt, who contributed substantially. By 1940, there were 46,000 volumes here, and by 55, there were over 100,000 volumes there. And you can see it there, and um, the other buildings as well, which, which you would know. And this is the plaque. Perhaps you've seen it. It's uh, right at the door there as you enter Schmidt Building. And it lists all the members of what was called the uh, Xavier Foundation, the principal donors, including uh, John Gillian, the father of the governor of Ohio-to-be. And the tribute here to Walter Seaton Schmidt, uh, oh, quite touching, and testimony of his filial devotion, his culture and love of literature, his extraordinary munificence, and so forth. We owe a great deal to Walter Seaton Schmidt for many reasons. He uh, raised the money and, and contributed substantially to the library. He also built the field house in memory of his parents, Frederick, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Schmidt. He chaired the athletic board for years and were probably responsible, if any one man was, for the strength of the football program. And then went on to offer a great deal of advice to presidents on buying real estate and building up this campus. Uh, and we can move on. Uh, this is uh, the, you'll recognize, of course, as the um, a lodge uh, or the Connaughton room now, but this was the reading room of the library when it was finished in 1926 and open. You'll notice on the left there, the circulation desk over here, and just beyond it, the card catalog. And if you went through that door just behind the circulation desk, into where the president's office now is, that's where the stacks were. Only faculty and a few students were allowed in there for reasons I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Yeah. This is Mr. Albert Wurst. He was librarian for many years, down to 1972, and he is serving as student here at that circulation desk in the library. These are the stacks. 
And little wonder that only a few souls were allowed in there. I suspect the catacombs of Rome might have been more congenial. <laughs> and, and these gentlemen are working in those stacks. I remember them vaguely in my early years here at Xavier, till that whole area was cleared out and the, the area renovated. And this is high tech in the old era. This is from 1952, and they're showing off new equipment. These are gifts. Notice the two microfilm readers, and notice the long playing phonograph records. They thought these were really the last word in those days. Showing them off is Mr. Worst on the right, and in the middle is Dr. Ray McCoy. I don't know if many of you will know him. Another very important figure in Xavier history, really the founder of our education department and graduate school dean for many, many years, an influential person. Here he's just showing off the equipment, however. The other one I don't know. This also took place in the reading room, and it's interesting. This is the Philippidian Debating Society, which we no longer have. It is the oldest extracurricular activity at Xavier. It goes back to 1841. And here are the debaters in our library near the fireplace there. Interesting. And this is the Glee Club performing again in, in uh, what is now Conatum. This picture is dated February the 21st, 1941. And when I came across it, I had a bit of a lump on my throat and I thought to myself, this is just a few months before Pearl Harbor. And I'm sure every one of those young men went off to war. And you wonder how many of them ever came back. It's uh, kind of a, a moment for thought. And, and this is Mr. Walter Seaton Schmidt. He was president of Frederick uh, Schmidt Real Estate Agency here in Cincinnati and a very distinguished looking gentleman and one to whom we owe a great debt. And in 66, 1966, it was clear that the library was much too small and the new one had to come. And this is the beginning of it. Uh, you're looking eastward again. And I kind of like this picture. Of course, you, you have the excavation here. But notice Kelly Auditorium. Uh, those of you who have been around back before they came down, and all those houses along Ledgewood, which were torn down about maybe eight or nine years ago, in order to make room uh, for the, uh, the, the quad. This, of course, now would be the mall. And here's another picture of basically the same excavation. Here's Alter Hall on the left. And uh, I like this picture. These are the famous barracks. I don't know if you have heard, after the Second War, World War, the university bought about 12, 14 army barracks, which they installed along what is essentially where Schott, the library, and uh, Alter now are, along this ridge here. And there they are. In his book, Roger Fortin says, we did away with those in 1955. Well, this is 1966, and there's... <laughs> Two of them are still there. Can you imagine? They say they were insufferably hot in the summertime and miserably cold in the winter. But students actually lived there for, for quite a few years. Ask my conditum <coughs> about it, Jim. This is down their view uh, of the building itself. And you can see uh, the, the amount of building that went on in the 1960s. First of all, you have Alter Hall, which was finished in 60, open for use in 61. The chapel, which was dedicated in December of 62, the library here, which opened in 67, and shot right next to it, which opened in 70. So it was a, a time of tremendous building. And, um, and this, this will give you a good idea of it. Yeah? And uh, so this is the, uh, the building that we're honoring today. And um, for those of you who haven't been around a while, you'll notice the D'Artagnan statue here in its original place on the uh, plaza. And here is the academic mall, still we're coming through here as, as it does today. And this is the Andrew J. and Mary McDonald Memorial Library. It was a gift of Walter and George McDonald, the McDonald Foundation. It had an original capacity of 350,000 volumes. It gave the university over 63,000 square feet of space. 
And it cost about $1,800,000, of which the McDonald's gave a million dollars, a very substantial gift. It's described as being in buff brick. So I kind of like that, buff brick. Uh, and uh, it trimmed with Indiana limestone. And this comes from an article in the Enquirer. I love this. Though contemporary in style and feeling, the charm of Xavier's older buildings, which are in the Tudor Gothic mode, was retained. A striking feature is the tall, narrow windows, which repeat the perpendicular of the Gothic. Well, maybe. <laughs> But anyway, that was how it was described at the time. And this became, of course, the fifth home of Xavier's library. And this is the gentleman, uh, Do uh, Mr. Walter uh, McDonald. He was the president and founder of McDonald Printing. And this is the gentleman, along with his brother, who contributed a million dollars to the building of this building. Here is a copy of the invitation to the dedication which occurred on May the 7th, 1967. Notice it was not only a dedication, but a formal academic convocation at the time. They really pulled out all the stops for this. And this is the invitation. And, and this is what the program looked like on that occasion. They invited a number of people. Uh, Milton Backrack, the mayor of Cincinnati was here. James Rhodes, the governor of Ohio, was here. Uh, Archbishop uh, Alter was also here. He, he did the dedication itself. And also in, in, in attendance here and honored on the same occasion uh, was the main speaker on that particular occasion. I'm looking for his name here. At any rate, we can move on in. This is the dedication uh, of the, the building itself. Notice, I suspect this might be up on the second floor. The Knights of Columbus were there in full armor. And Archbishop Alter, after whom Alter Hall is named, he blessed the building with holy water. I think this is Father John McAvoy on his right. He was master of ceremonies of the occasion. And I believe that's Mr. McDonald on his left. So they gave the building uh, a blessing on that occasion. And this is Dr. Malik. This was the principal speaker on the occasion. Dr. Malik had been president of the UN General Assembly just before he came here. He was honored, he gave the main address and was honored with an honorary degree, along with James Rhodes and also Ernest Miller, who was director of the Cincinnati Library. I don't know where that is. I suspect that's in Alter Hall in the old Kelly Auditorium. It looks like the stage to me. On the right here is Father Paul O'Connor, the president of Xavier University at the, at the time, president for 17 years. Uh, and let's move on. Uh, a few shots from around. The old timers will remember this, but originally there was a fountain in front of the library. This is the main entrance here. The, the, the main door is right here. And this is a very nice fountain and always very beautiful. And every spring along about this time, some <laughs> thoughtful undergraduate would toss a bar of soap into that fountain. And we would come by and the soap suds would be up to about here. Till to the delight of the maintenance crew, they had to clean the place out. This is the very first circulation desk in this building. Uh, the main entrance is right here. So you came right into the building where the maker space is. That's where the original uh, reception desk was. And there's a distinguished gentleman, if you look carefully on the far left there, Gordon Suggs is in the picture. Yeah, yes, that's the original circulation. And of course, everybody remembers the card catalogs. And uh, there they are. And this is a picture from 1966. This is probably when the building was just being finished. And we all made a great deal of use of those cards. Yeah. This is Paula Warkin, who was librarian here for about nine years, 1983 to about 1992. And those around a while remember the wonderful work that Paula did. Talking about technology, I love this picture. <laughs> Talking about technology, I was, what I really wanted was a picture. There was a typing room. You see this here? This is the typing room. And it, it had in it, as I understand, about 12 typewriters, just like that one there. 
And that was high tech in 1966. And for those of you who have never typed a term paper on one of those babies, you don't know what frustration is. <laughs> and I think, uh, but to that, uh, and the next one. Of course, there was the copier, 10 cents a copy, however, but it's done in seconds with a guarantee there. Remember the library cards? You would come into the library and if you, when you took out the volume, you removed this card from a little packet in the back, you took it to the circulation desk, signed your name there, and then the librarian stamped it with the two-week date in which it was due. Notice it, it was used down in 1986. So we're going to talk about that in a minute though. And of course, microfilm. Microfilm, this picture is from about 1980. I don't know who that worker is. And also in uh, microfiche, another invention from about 1885. The library always on the cutting edge. <laughs> but this is where the big change occurred. In night, <laughs> the people you probably recognize, I, this is our own Vicki Young. <laughs> this is Paula Warnkin, I mentioned before. And this is Kendra Moulton, the daughter of uh, Dr. Moulton, retired a few years ago. What's going on here? Well, in 19. 89, the university decided, and it was one of the first in the area to do it, to scrap all those um, catalog files and go high tech, an online catalog system. And one of the first in the city, as a matter of fact. What they had to do, they wanted it to be introduced at the beginning of the 90, 91 school year in the fall. So the previous Christmas, over Christmas holidays, 22 librarians and 18 students worked feverishly to put a barcode on every single volume, 250,000 of them, here in the library. And I understand by the time the second semester started, they had finished about 97% of the task. Every book had to be barcoded so they could go high tech, which they did. And I understand on time. So we had one of the very first online catalog systems in 1990. And uh, it worked very well since. And <laughs> <laughs> Now I, I have <laughs> For your information, the machine here is an InfoTrack academic index. Did I get that right, Vicki? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> This is an inventory of, news, of magazine articles. And uh, the machine, the story is when we purchased this, the machine did not work well. <laughs> the story is, I, you know, I've heard this, that Vicki Young, our own Vicki Young, dressed appropriately, brought her wand in one day, touched the machine <laughs> just once, and after that worked perfectly. <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but, but uh, it's a good picture. Uh, and, we now had an automatic, online, computerized catalog system, but it had no name. So during the fall semester of 90, the library did a very wise thing. They held a contest, and they invited all faculty, students, alums, anyone to suggest names for the new online automatic catalog system. And they held a party in December 1990, as you can see, to announce the winner. And the winner, the winning name is Explore, which actually we use today. And I'll have to look this up because I'll bet even the librarians don't know what Explore stands for. Explore, which is now the name of our automatic online system, Xavier's Personal Library Online Research Enhancer. That's it. <laughs> But the two winners are being announced here. They've just announced the winner. And the two winners, as you, as you notice there, would be Father Jerry Tracy. And Father Jerry Tracy uh, taught theology at the time and now in retirement uh, up in Columbia. And John Johnston. I don't know if you remember John Johnston was a chemistry major. And I believe uh, John now is actually a professor of chemistry at Vanderbilt University. But they were the two winners selecting the name Explorer. And in, in 2011, of course, you know, we had extensive decoration and this then became the new circulation desk of the library for a short period of time. We'll remember it well, that's when it was referred to as the Information Resources Center. And 
And now we've come down to the most recent of our innovations, and this is the makerspace area, which is right over here in the corner uh, where the old uh, circulation desk used to be. And the makerspace is a creative, dynamic space where students, faculty, and staff invent, build, and learn. It was the result of two generous grants, one from SWAN, the local consortium of libraries, and the Xavier University Women of Excellence who contributed to it. So this space is now in function for about a year. It was opened just a year ago, and you could visit it on your way out if you like. Many important people have visited you. Let me show you. <laughs> Here he is. You just never know who's going to drop into the ma ma maker space. And there he is checking things out. Or what can be created there. I find this very, very interesting as well. This is something that uh, uh, really, and I don't think it's on display right now, but it was created there. And, and certainly uh, no production and no discussion in the library would really be complete without talking about our um, special books collection. It's an unfortunate secret around here, but we have a marvelous collection of books, and a number of them are on display over here. But I'd like to point out a couple. This is, I think, a beautiful piece. Let me tell you a little bit about it. This is a Bible, and it is the oldest book in Xavier's special collection. It's a handwritten manuscript on vellum, created in the 13th century. It includes many decorated initials and an illustrated page featuring gold leaf accents. It's a part of a collection that was donated by Zelda Friel to Xavier in memory of her husband, John Whiting Field, in 1973. And it is a beautiful thing. It's well worth taking a look at. I think it's exquisite in its design. And we're also very proud of this book, and it's also over there, and you want to take a look at it. This is called an antiferry, or a psalter. And this huge book was used by monks through the Middle Ages and later in chanting the divine office. So that's why you see the Gregorian chant there and also the text in Latin. This is also handwritten on vellum. It dates from the 15th century. It was produced in Spain. It uh, has, of course, the Gregorian chant there, as I mentioned. The extensive repairs suggest that it was heavily used by choir monks throughout the years. So this is not just something that sat on a shelf. Apparently, this was heavily used. Third, this is also among our, our really prize uh, uh, ownings and ownings. This is the Nuremberg Chronicle. The Nuremberg Chronicle is a famous book, an example of very early printed material. That's why it's very, very valuable. It was published in Nuremberg in Germany in 1493. It depicts the history of the world as described in the Bible. It contains nearly 2,000 woodcut illustrations, which was a significant achievement in the production of early printed books. And what you see here is a map of the world, one of those woodcuts. So you can see uh, little old Europe there, and Africa here, and Asia here. And uh, it's a beautiful thing, and if you have a moment, do stop and take a look at it. And last but not least, we're very, very proud of the Moses Dawson collection. This is simply an envelope of a letter written by Andrew Jackson to a noted Cincinnatian by the name of Moses Dawson. And this collection is 181 letters that were written to Mr. Dawson in the first part of the 19th century, from about 1811 to about 1844. Uh, Moses Dawson was the editor of the Cincinnati Ad Advertiser, the forerunner of the Enquirer, and an influential figure, received letters from many famous people, including four presidents. Uh, President William Henry Harrison, there are letters from Andrew Jackson, there are letters from Andrew, Martin Van Buren and James Polk, among the 180. And these letters were donated to Xavier University in 1934 by an alum by the name of Joseph DeBar. And Joseph DeBar's wife happened to be a descendant of Moses Dawson, and that's how we got those letters, of which we're very, very proud, and which I think now are on our website, aren't they? Yes, if you'd like to, to view them. Yeah. Well, that's it. I probably am longer than brief, but. Uh, that's my presentation, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Father Keneally, for a wonderful <laughs> presentation. You did not disappoint. <laughs> from 16th century, even 13th century books that migrated from Europe and found its way into our collections to now 3D printed objects. It's been an amazing journey for this library and one that I think mirrors the institution's own rich history. In making concluding remarks, Another student, I, as I mentioned, we had to recognize Matthew earlier because he had to leave, but another student that we want to recognize is our student photo contest winner. All current students were invited to submit a photograph that embodied the McDonald Memorial Library, and the winner of that contest is Tricia Brockmeyer. <coughs> Tricia. <coughs> Tricia receives a $100 Visa card for, uh, thank you. <laughs> you can see her photo photograph that she took over here to the left, in which I'll read a statement she wrote about it. I chose to take this picture among the stacks on the second floor. The fiction section is where I go when I'm stressed out. Being amongst those books reminds me of how much opportunity I have to create a story worth telling out of my own life. The open book at the table showed the invitation that the library always offers me to explore the stories of others. So thank you again for <laughs> Lastly, I would like to invite everyone to have a piece of McDonald birthday cake as you continue to visit and fellowship with one another. On your way out, please be sure to stop by the table by the makerspace as we have a special commemorative gift for each of you. Also, before leaving, you are invited to go to the third floor to see the companion display on the history of Xavier's Library, which was curated by recently retired archives librarian Tim McCabe. Tim is here, and we're glad that he could join us today. <laughs> Additionally, while on the third floor, you'll notice we have some guests, special guests visiting us uh, from Tibet. We have a number of monks here who, are, who started today creating a sand mandala, and that process will go on until Friday when we will have a special concluding ceremony. So I'm sure that many of you will find that interesting to watch as well. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you for honoring us with your presence today. Please take your time, enjoy visiting with each other. I know um, uh, there's still plenty of food and drinks to be had and an opportunity, as Father Keneally pointed out, to look at some of these wonderful treasures. Um, and again, just thank you uh, for taking time out of your day to come and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.